Welcome to the R video tutorial on random number generation. This is part of Statistics 321 at Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, actually, in this video, we're really not going to talk about R. First, we're going to talk about random number generation in the broad sense and what we're trying to do with it. Uh, so I'm just going to run through some slides here. And in the next videos, we'll actually talk about actually how to do it. So just hang on. So we are all on the same page. We can talk about the random number generation and how to do it first. So here are the goals. Why do we even need random numbers? Uh, how do we relate these to probability distributions? We're going to need cumulative probability distributions. We're going to need uniform random numbers. And then we're going to talk about how to sample from a probability distribution. And then down at the bottom it says using R to sample from a probability distribution. And that will actually be in the next video. Uh, so if you're looking for that, just move on to the next video. But you might want to look at this just to make sure you're aware of what we're trying to do. Okay, so let's get going here. Why random numbers? Well, often we want to understand the behavior of things that are random, um, that we want to predict, and sometimes they're easy to do and sometimes they're hard to do. Uh, often it's trying to understand a behavior, not trying to model something directly as in, in the past, but something that will happen in the future. So, for example, we might be interested in produ uh, predicting the future stock price, and you have to think about that. That is random. You don't know what it's going to be. Right, So it's a random event, so you would like to use random numbers, possibly, to help you understand how to predict that. And I put next to that, it's really, really hard to do. Uh, however, you can predict future demand for a specific product. If you have years and years of uh, product, it's easy or relatively easy to actually predict this stuff, and you would actually need some sort of random number generations, depending on what type of model you're using. Uh, you can also use it to predict the behavior of a bus system. Uh, so, for example, you can predict if people will be picked up at the right time, uh, how many people will be delayed, all kinds of things. And there's a whole bunch of randomness in there, right? Because there's a different number of people getting on each bus stop at each time, which is random. How long it takes the bus to get from one stop to another is random because there's things that happen in between. Uh, there's just a whole lot of randomness in it. And if you don't use the randomness, it becomes very hard to understand the true behavior. You might be able to say, I predict one thing, but you may not understand about how uncertain you are about those. Another one is uh, understanding the random behavior of influenza. That You could use uh, random numbers for that as well. All right, so the first thing we're going to need to do is uh, talk about probability distributions. Uh, and probability distributions characterize the likelihood of a value being observed, and it usually has a function that's associated with it. And here I have f of x, and then I have this bar, which means given, and this is theta, which is the probability distribution's parameters. Uh, it has some nice properties in the sense that this function always has to be positive. Uh, and I actually can, I got it wrong here. It should be less than or, e or greater than or equal to zero. So I'll go back and fix that for the future. But uh, in the future, you'll notice that they always have to be positive or zero. Uh, and then they integrate to one, always. They will always integrate to one. So that's uh, something that's really important because probabilities are bound between zero and one. And we actually use probability distributions or these densities to pull out probabilities. Okay, so here's an example of a probability density function. So this is the normal or the Gaussian probability distribution, and it actually has two parameters. So in this case, theta is two numbers instead of one number. Uh, we have a mean and a standard deviation, and you've seen this uh, in your previous statistics classes. It's the standard bell curve. Uh, I have a graph of one here that's centered at zero with a standard deviation of one. Uh, but the height of this tells how likely something is to happen. So if you look out here, negative four is much less likely than zero. You can actually see how much the likelihood goes up when we're at a specific value. Okay, here's a different one that you may not have seen. This is the exponential probability distribution, and it only has one parameter, which is beta. And here you can see that it is only a positive number. Okay, so any negative number would have assigned been probability of zero or likelihood of zero. Uh, so we don't have any negative numbers allowed here. And this is often good for modeling waiting times between things, uh, especially if things can happen fairly quickly. How long do you actually have to wait for something to happen? 
Uh, and remember, when you're waiting in time, it's always a positive number. It's likely that it's not going to take terribly long. It's incredibly unlikely that it's going to take forever, and that's why it slopes off like this. All right, so what we're going to need from these are the cumulative probability distributions. So again, we have calculus. So if you're not a big fan of calculus, just roll with it. You don't need it that much uh, for this class, but we need to have the details here. Um, so what we have is, is we have this probability density function that we integrate. And we're going to integrate it from negative infinity up to the value that we're interested in. And this actually gives us a probability. So our cumulative probability distribution function is an actual probability when you get a value out of it. And you can use it to determine other probabilities uh, later. You've actually played with these before. If you've ever dealt with a normal table, it's a cumulative probability distribution function. It's just laid out in the table so you don't have to do all the math. Okay, so here's what one looks like. Uh, this is the actual normal CDF. And the key p feature of these things is, is they're actually probabilities. And they're between 0 and 1. And that's really, really important for later because we're going to use that property to help us generate random numbers. So if you look here, it, the probabilities are always bound between 0 and 1, and it's always monotonically increasing as well. Okay, so here's the one for the exponential, just so you can see that this one looks different than the other one. This one kind of looks like an S, if you look at it. The, for the normal, when I go to the exponential, definitely doesn't look like an S. And it does start at 0, and it goes up to 1. So keep that in mind. These are always between 0 and 1. Okay, so here's a, a density function that we're going to use. And it is the uniform probability density function. And it's uniform between 0 and 1. It has a probability of 1 across here, or likelihood of 1, not a probability of 1. Uh, likelihood of 1. And they're all the same likelihood, which means any value between 0 and 1 is equally likely as any other one. And the key is, is it's between 0 and 1. And that relates back to the fact that our CDF is between 0 and 1. So we're going to use this to our advantage. Now, we're not going to worry about how you sample from a uniform probability density function. Uh, it's quite complicated, and I'm not sure that there's enough math background for many of you to be able to handle this. So we're just going to assume that they've worked out how to do this piece. Uh, to actually calculate a uniform random variant. We're going to take that number, and we can, if we draw, draw a whole bunch of them, I think I drew 10,000 here, you can see from the histogram that each one is about equally likely. Uh, and these little bumps that are up above each other, that's just due to randomness. It's not due to the fact that this one is really more likely than this one over here. Uh, so keep that in mind. These are about uniform random variables, and we're going to use that to our advantage. They're always between 0 and 1 in this case. So here's how we're going to do this. It's called inverse CDF sampling. There's lots of sampling techniques, by the way. So if you're an expert in sampling, you'll say, oh, my gosh, Ed, you left out this method and this method and this method. Uh, the point here is I want to show you in general how you can do this, not be bogged down into the actual technical details. If you want to get into the technical details, uh, that's much for a much more advanced class. All right, so here's how we do this. Step one, we're going to draw from a uniform probability density function. And we're going to take this and we're going to plug this into the inverse of f. So we've got a cumulative distribution function. We're going to find its inverse, and we're going to plug our random draw in there, and that's going to give us a random variable or a random draw from the actual distribution that we're looking for. Okay, and step three is do it many, 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 many times until you have the number of samples that you want. So if you want to replicate something a thousand times, then you would do this procedure a thousand times. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to do this in pictures. Okay, so inverse CDF sampling in pictures. The, the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to take and we're going to put our CDF up here. It's not the distribution or the density. It's the actual cumulative probability distribution. I'm going to draw a value along this axis. It's between 0 and 1, and it's uniform. And I've denoted, here's where my point is right here. Hopefully you can all can see this. And then what I'm going to do is I am going to trace this back over to where it actually hits the CDF. Okay, I'm going to go horizontally. I'm going to find out where it hits the CDF. 
and then I'm going to map it back down to this axis. So I'm just going to use the idea of inverse functions. So I take a random draw from here, bring it over, hit the uh, CDF, take it down uh, vertically, and hit the x-axis, and this becomes my random draw. Now, like I said, do it multiple times. So if I were to do this multiple times, here's what I would get. So here I did it 25 times, and you can see along this axis, I pulled off uniform variates uh, out of the uniform distribution, brought them over, and mapped them back. And if you look here, there's hardly anything out here shows it's unlikely to be out there. Uh, but there's a whole lot more in this region, which is there's more likely to be there. And if we took this and did this even more, here we go. I did it 100 times. And you can see when I trace all of these back, there's a whole lot more points along here than out here. And that's part of the key to this, is that we're going back like this. We're tracing it back, and it's giving us the distribution we want. And if I were to take a histogram of that, this is what it actually looks like. Uh, and that looks very close to the probability density function that we were looking at for this in the sense that it curves, it was high up here, and then it curves out. All right, so here's I did it for a normal distribution. So you can see what it looks like. So here's the normal CDF. I've pulled off a whole bunch uh, or a hundred of these random uniform and it looks pretty uniform across here there's only a few little gaps uh, and then I hit the CDF and I map it back to X and this gives me my distribution and when I do a histogram of this this is what it looks like it doesn't look like a perfect normal distribution like our original curve up the at the beginning of the talk but it is right where we want it to be it's actually sampling from the correct distribution and that's important. Uh, so this is the basics of one of the sampling techniques that's usually pretty easy to understand. It's easy to graph. And I want you to have a sense of how to generate random numbers if you had a CDF so that you can generate it from actually any distribution you can. Uh, and there's lots and lots of distributions that are not nice, by the way. And there's lots and lots of sampling techniques. And those are reserved for a more advanced class. All right, so this has been the R video tutorial on random sampling. Uh, we didn't actually do any R, so move to the next video and we'll start doing some R.